Well, we are all very excited to be back here at FOSS Backstage, our second year running. Uh, we're here to talk about preparing for zero day vulnerability disclosure within open source software. I'll let the folks introduce themselves. Excellent. We're going left to right. <laughs> Hello, my name is Anne Bertuccio. I am a senior program manager in Google's open source programs office. Uh, what that means is I work a lot with Googlers who are engaged in open source, but also just generally kind of an advocate in the open source community where my focus area is security. And in particular, I'm very passionate about vulnerability disclosure. I will kick it to Jennifer. Thanks, Anne. Um, great to be back this year at FOSS Backstage. My name is Jennifer Furnick. Um, I'm the Senior Vice President and Global Head of Research at NCC Group, which is a really large cybersecurity consulting company. So I run one of the biggest private sector security research teams in the world, and we find lots and lots of vulnerabilities. Um, I'm also one of the founding board members of the Open Source Security Foundation, OpenSSF, which we're here to celebrate and speak from today. Um, and in the past, I guess I was a cryptographer, I was a security researcher. I ran security at a bank, um, but now I'm helping people find and disclose all the vulns. Crow. Very nice. And I am Crobe. I have had the great pleasure to work a very long time uh, doing security at assorted organizations. Uh, today, I'm currently a communications director for security issues for Intel, but historically, I worked with the uh, Red Hat product security team, and I am a involved in many, many, many upstream uh, ecosystem things like the OpenSSF, uh, first the bug bounty community of interest. So we have an exciting little panel here today, but before we started, we wanted to kind of set some context. So if I could ask, um, you know, the, the panel here, can we maybe talk about some of these terms very quickly to help get everyone a, a base level of information? That sounds great. Maybe to kick things off. So we're here to talk about vulnerability disclosure, which is kind of a weird topic because there's not very much written down about it. It's kind of something that is secretly whispered amongst people in the know. And at OpenSSF and amongst ourselves, we really think this is a terrible idea because if more people knew how to receive vulnerabilities, how to report vulnerabilities and how to communicate with each other, we could make the internet a lot more secure. So the point in our presentation today is to demystify a lot of this stuff that is kind of in this like, you know, behind the scenes whispered conversations in the security community, because the more we all know about it, the better we can do. Um, so uh, maybe I'll hand off to either Crobe or Anne if you guys want to talk through some of these definitions. Yeah, I think probably the first thing is, you know, in our, we said zero day, but let's maybe define first what is and is not a vulnerability. And then that term zero day, because I think it's like a, you see it thrown about in the press, thrown about on Twitter, and not everything's actually a zero day. So let's start with vulnerability. Um, you know, a vulnerability is a weakness in the software um, that is not working as intended, and it is causing adverse effects. We typically think about that in terms of data exfiltration, uh, data access, and uh, data integrity are kind of some big areas. So it is not just that this is a security issue where, oh, poor design choice, we really should have done this better, or, oh, it's kind of a bug and it's maybe in a security component. Um, something is going wrong that is causing uh, something in that area, the, you know, the data exfiltration, access, integrity to be compromised. And Krobe, maybe you can, as a um, P-cert, speak to what CVE is and what's going on with those numbers. I certainly can. So there needs to be a method with which different groups can share information about a common problem. CVE is that common language. It's um, a way, it's a descriptor that describes one particular security vulnerability. And that way, um, end consumers and even um, you know contributors to a project can understand, I see CVE XYZ in this library. Well, some other distribution or product or something might have that same CVE. So now you understand that those two things were affected um, by this similar problem. And again, it's just CVE is just an identifier and it's a way that we can kind of all make sure we're talking about the same thing. There might, a lot of issues might look similar, but they might not at their root cause and uh, of all the circumstances that led to them being there might not be the same. And then I think the, the most important concept and 
the whole reason why uh, disclosing zero days can be challenging would be our last topic. And maybe Jennifer could talk a little bit about embargo. So when we have an embargo, it's when we make an agreement um, that we will not talk about something until a certain time. So we have this time period where the security flaw is known to the person who found it. It might be known to perhaps the project or the product that has this flaw, but it isn't public yet. And that gives us some time to work together so that we can fix that vulnerability. So that like if I'm the researcher that found it and Crobe, you're receiving this or Anne, you're receiving this, um, I could tell you about the vulnerability. We'd have some time to fix it. Usually it's 30, 60 or 90 days is pretty typical in our industry, but we sometimes see shorter or longer timelines than that. Um, and then after that date, we would agree in advance, you know, in 30 days, we'll make this public. Hopefully by that time, there's a patch available or at least some kind of mitigation. Um, but then we can make things widely known, which enables, you know, downstream um, dependencies to patch and all of these kinds of good things we want to see. And the big goal of that coordination for the embargo is to make sure that no end user of that software or hardware is more at risk than the others, that everybody has an equal playing field time to get mitigations, the patches, whatever, at the same time so that they can react before the bad guys find out, hopefully. So that actually rolls us into our first question. Um, I know. So Jennifer... I, I was curious. I, I we mentioned zero day a couple times. Could we maybe describe what actually is a zero day vulnerability? Absolutely. And maybe just to give some structure to this talk, we're going to go through a couple of questions about things we think are important to know. And we're going to leave some time at the end as well. So if any people in the audience want to ask us things, you can ask us anything. Um, so when we talk about a zero day vulnerability, we've covered this a little bit. When we have a vulnerability, that's a kind of bug. It's a specific kind of bug that affects security. And when we talk about zero day, it's generally something that's not previously known by the affected project or vendor. And what this means is they had zero days to fix it. Um, now, sometimes a vulnerability is found, and this is the good thing, this is what we want to see, the researcher will reach out to the project or to the vendor and try and get them to patch it, and we have that embargo period we talked about, and then, um, you know, patches are released and the internet is educated about the vulnerability and hopefully things work really well from there. Um, but sometimes people do something called dropping zero day, um, which sounds cool, but is actually a lot of times not a good thing, um, because what it means is the researcher is going to just it free on the internet. They will either publish details about the software flaw and where you can find it and the type of flaw that it is. And sometimes they'll even publish something called an exploit where you have a piece of software that you can use to attack that software flaw. And it can affect not just your project, but all the projects that depend on your project and all of those users downstream, which is really concerning. Um, I have a couple of facts on this slide that I think are really important to know and that when I first learned them were very surprising. Um, so one of the things is this came out of the GitHub um, State of the Octoverse report, I think a year or two ago. Um, they found that open source software vulnerabilities on average take more than four years between the time they exist and they're in the code base and the time that they're actually detected and people start writing patches for them. Um, we also know um, that from certain surveys of the internet that 84% of open source code bases have at least one vulnerability. And of that survey that was taken, in, there were an average of like over 150 bones per code base. So to all the maintainers that are here today, um, that's something really concerning because that means chances are there's bugs and maybe even a lot of bugs in your code base. Um, and then finally, something that really scares me from like a researcher perspective is in security, we have this thing called threat intelligence where we're monitoring what's happening on the internet. What are you know, bad guys doing? Um, what types of things are they attacking? Where are we seeing you know, different traffic going? Um, and when we're monitoring threat intelligence and when we're looking at what's happening on the internet, we're seeing that the exploitation of vulnerabilities, so there's this flaw in your software, it's sitting there on GitHub for who knows how long. Um, the timeline it used to take as of a couple of years ago was over a month, it was about a month and a half between the time an attacker might find it or um, a patch might be released and the time that um, you know the bad the, the adversaries start attacking and exploiting it. 
Now it's only three days. So we've gone from a month and a half to deal with all of that mess down to just a couple of days. And that means we have to act faster than ever before. And this is a real challenge for open source maintainers. Um, and I guess the last thing I wanted to share though, when we talk about zero days is um, how to feel about all of this. Cause I think there's a lot of darkness and shame and um, misconceptions around this for software developers. And a really important thing to know is we're all on the same team. So of the two things that I would share, um, the first one is that all complex software has flaws. Um, a lot of security people like to say all computers are broken and we want to make that less true, right? We want there to be less brokenness, but you shouldn't be ashamed or you need to hide if there's a report of a vulnerability in your code. Um, all that matters at that time is how you respond to it and what you can do to write patches and deploy them to your users to make them safer. Um, furthermore, the other thing that's important to know is kind of that this is a little bit asymmetric and it's a little bit... Um, bias toward the researcher and they have a little more power in this interaction and that's challenging but we can manage that challenge researchers have options so something Anne's going to talk to us about a little bit later is that when a researcher has a zero day they can sell it they could sell it for a million dollars on you know dark marketplaces they could drop the zero day like we talked about and just set it free on the internet and become kind of famous for doing that they could use it to write malware they could use it to do a lot of dangerous things or they could reach out to you and help educate you about it and help you write a patch. So another thing to keep in mind is if you're hearing from a researcher, um, they probably actually really do want help and they do want to work together. So that leaves an interesting question. Who, if a vulnerability is found, who owns it? Mm. Well, I would be of the opinion that it, the researcher kind of owns it. You know, this is their work. They they discovered this the same way that, you know, when you submit a feature to a code base, you kind of feel like I, I wrote this, even though you're contributing it, which is whole, I'm sure there's talk about licensing happening somewhere this week or multiple talks. But, you know, I think we kind of take that same approach that um, the researcher found it. We have to think of, you know, they're in the driver's seat with like what Jennifer's saying, which option they want to pursue, how they want to pursue it. And as we'll probably, I think we're gonna talk about a little bit later, including timelines. Like Jennifer was talking about those 30, 60, 90 days. Well, you know, if the researcher is like, hey, I, for whatever reason, it's really important to me that uh, this is disclosed in seven days, you know, there's, it's kind of their right to, to do that. This is something they found. Yeah, there's certainly when we talk about like um, ethics in coordinated disclosure, there's certainly things that I would consider more ethical behavior than other things. And everyone has a slightly different line as to where that is. But ultimately, the researcher is in the driver's seat. So whether they're doing things that you or I would agree with or not, we have to keep in mind that they're the ones sitting on the vulnerability. And we have to kind of work with what they're offering and accommodate as much as we can to make things as safe as we can within those parameters that they're going to share with us. And, and I would note, generally, if the researcher is approaching you, this isn't everybody, but if they are approaching you, they legitimately want to solve the problem and make things better. That's normally the motivation outside of financial or fame or the other motivating factors. A lot of researchers do just want to make the internet more safe and secure. I like a safe internet. <laughs> um, so my next question would be focused to Anne. Uh, how do different projects you know, share this information? I'm, I'm going to guess there's a lot of different coding languages, a lot of different source code repositories, a lot of different purposes for software. How do these projects share vulnerability information? Yeah. So, you know, we kind of um, jumped a little bit ahead in assuming that we're going to talk today about coordinated vulnerability disclosure. And we'll, there's a lovely slide and some resources that we can share to talk about what that is. But, you know, it is the assumption that the researchers reached out to you as the project maintainer. And now you're going to want to coordinate somehow. What are we going to do about this? Um, there are obviously some security concerns with how you're going to interact and share that information. But, you know, there's actually becoming more and more built in options in some common open source platforms to help folks with that. So there are, if you're a GitHub user, there's tools like the GitHub security advisory uh, feature where you can open up a private issue temporarily, add the researcher as a collaborator, and then have that conversation in a protected space. Um, I think, you know, in the years before where we had that, people were really focused on ensuring that we had encrypted communications between each other. 
And that's something that some researchers might prefer to see. But I think other folks say, you know what, if you're using a um, kind of common email provider, that encryption is probably already there. And that is the least of your problems. So if you're not comfortable signing your own emails and understanding how to work that, you know, a Gmail or something of the like is probably a okay, given you know, we're, make, we're making risk trade-offs here of priority number one, deal with the vulnerability, we can learn how to sign email later. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of different uh, options that people can use, but I think one of the really important things as a maintainer is to be clear with potential um, reporters where, where you wanna receive that information. You wanna make sure those directions are super clear. Um, we frequently call it a security policy. That's that security.md file in GitHub. I think a lot of other Garrett-based platforms also use security.md, um, but just very clear directions on if you find something, here's how to get a hold of me. And I think there's also, uh, depending on where you are in the supply chain, if you are consuming a library or a code from an upstream project, there's a lot of different ways these projects can share information. A lot of it's done through the source code management, like a, a Git-based system. Uh, some of them use defect trackers like Bugzilla. Um, uh, some of the old school ones still use mailing lists, which is great. They might have a private mailing list or it might be done publicly. Uh, there could be some type of forum. And when you get, depending on you know the scope and scale of the software you're working on, you may have a dedicated security team of some type that uh, helps ingest and triage those issues and uh, help prioritize things for you. It just depends on how big your software is and kind of the, the group of folks you're collectively working with. And I believe, Anne, you have an excellent little example of just in general how CVD, Coordinated Vulnerability Disclosure, is done. You want to share yes. a little bit? Yeah, we can kind of walk through this just at a really high level. Um, you know, we've talked about this researcher finds vulnerability they want to report it to you. That's where those really clear directions are important. And then that next step is the assessment that harken back to 10 minutes ago when we were talking about, is it a bug? Is it actually uh, working as intended because we designed our, our project this way? Um, or is it actually a vulnerability? And we want to make that assessment and then communicate very clearly back to the reporter what our decision is about that. You know, um, if the there's a disagreement. It's good to have that conversation. Uh, actually, Jennifer, I think you've talked about a lot of researchers are um, interested in jumping on a call and explaining if there is that disagreement, what's going on and why and what they saw, um, being open to hearing from them. Um, and so then we decide, you know, yes, it is a vulnerability. We want to move on to that patching. Um, it, some, something that I think is interesting is, uh, you know, sometimes researchers are actually really excited to work on a patch. Sometimes they're they're not. Their interest is in what they found, and they said, "Here you go." And now I'm going to step back. This is I'm not, uh, you know, I did my bit here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Cleaned my hands of this vulnerability. Now it's yours. Um, but sometimes they're actually like, "I'm really excited. I want to see this through to the end. I actually have an idea about how to fix this." And I think all open source maintainers can relate to um, that. We need more hands. We need more help. So it's always great to ask the reporter, "Do you want to be a part of developing this patch with us?" you might get lucky and get an extra contributor. Um, and then we wanna move through and get that CVE assignment that Krobe was talking about because that's how we're gonna communicate things out into the world. And then we reach our final point, disclosure. Um, let's skip over embargo for now. That's a whole other topic. We're gonna shelf that over there. Uh, disclosure, we're gonna wanna share that out to our users. And you know, in open source, we don't have those user lists of I can absolutely verify every single user. Um, so we want to put things pretty publicly. Maybe that's on our project mailing list. It might be on our GitHub in the security tab. Uh, you know, some projects set up bigger ones. Like I think Kubernetes is a good example. I believe there's a specific security announce list just because of the high amount of mailing list traffic. Um, so thinking about, you know, once we have that CVE number and we release it, there's no benefit to keeping it private. We want to make sure users can find this information to have get access to it. So widely distributing, here's the patch, here's the affected versions, here's what you should do. Yeah, and there's a lot of different techniques there. You may publish a security bulletin or advisory if you're a large team. You might just have a comment in your Git repo, um, but it's a very important you want to notify those downstream of you uh, on some level that found a problem, 
here's how to fix it or what we did to respond to it. And, uh, you know, make sure that everybody is uh, able to get treatment. We, we've talked about, uh, oh, well, well, let's talk about this really quick. I saw this jumped in. Um, <laughs> what should we expect from researchers during a, a vulnerability disclosure? Yeah, I added this one in toward, you know, the very end of our time preparing for this presentation because I don't think there's good norms um, that are widely known about what is sketchy and what is reasonable good behavior in this type of interaction. So here's some things you can expect and here's some things you should like, definitely it's a red flag not accept those terms. Um, so things you'll see from a researcher, it's likely that they'll want to know when you intend to patch. And that's often because they're very invested in the vulnerability being remediated. But there also might be other reasons around getting CVEs, or they might want to talk about the research. And knowing when it's going to be patched allows those researchers that are trying to do this ethically, that want the internet to be a safer place, to know when they can start doing those things. And there are these typical um, notification windows. Um, it's very likely that your researcher will want to obtain a CVE. It's cool for them, coolness points, but it's also very important, as we've mentioned, to help people coordinate and understand and see where these flaws are in what versions of what software so that they can patch. Um, a researcher is likely to publish their own technical advisory, which will often look a lot like the bug report you initially receive, where they talk about, you know, what is the impact? What is the vuln? Um, how maybe they might give a rating of how severe the problem is, a recommendation of how they might fix it, and a timeline. So they're going to keep track of, I emailed this project on November 10th, and this project responded to me on November 11th. And they're going to keep track of all of those important milestones, and that will eventually be made public by most researchers when they publish um, about the flaw and the fix. Um, and it's often the case that researchers will do a blog post or a conference presentation about their findings, especially if it's high impact, to help educate the community about this type of flaw and also about how it's remediated. Now, on the flip side, here's some stuff that is very dodgy and you shouldn't expect to have to deal with this. And if you see it come through, you can know this isn't normal and that you don't necessarily have to adapt to this. So if a researcher asks you for money, sometimes we call that big bounty. That's not how it should be. Um, most professional security researchers are well compensated at the companies they work for. They're, they shouldn't be asking your project or a vendor for money. They're reporting this of their own generosity. Um, any kind of extortion, bribery, um, sketchy or illegal activity, that shouldn't be coming up. Um, they shouldn't be asking for privileged access to your machine or to your project's infrastructure. They shouldn't be having you run code that you don't know what it is on your machines. Um, they shouldn't be having you sign legal agreements or NDAs or any kind of um, silencing. There's often um, an informal idea of an embargo, but that's generally keeping the researcher at least as quiet as the developers. Um, so you wouldn't see things like NDAs. Um, and typically, there are some basic conditions that researchers seeking to operate ethically will uphold. They vary a bit researcher to researcher, but in general, um, you know, most researchers are going to try and make an earnest attempt to contact you, which is why putting that contact information is so important. Um, they're going to try to clearly communicate what is the vulnerability, where did we find it, and what is the impact to your system security. Um, and generally, they're going to try and agree with you on a timeline for when they're going to publish. Some people want to publish it really fast. Some teams do it in seven days. Um, some teams are a lot more open, and they might negotiate with you one month or two months or three months or perhaps beyond, especially if it's something lower level that's harder to patch. Um, so these are things that um, on the left you can really expect to see and on the right, they're kind of red flags and you don't have to necessarily accept those terms. It's uh, interesting. You've, you've touched on a couple terms and it'd be nice to get again, provide some definition here. And could you maybe help explain the difference between the acronym CVD, uh, VDP and DB for bug bounty? Yes. So CVD is coordinated vulnerability disclosure, which is just that philosophy. It's just an approach. Um, you know, other terms you might hear are full disclosure, which is coming from that security perspective of um, the, the sooner and the more open I get this out there, the better. Um, then there's private disclosure, which is the quieter we keep this, the better. Uh, there's arguments about, you know, which which of those approaches, but this group is really kind of advocates of coordinated vulnerability disclosure where we're going to do our best to privately sort this out and then we're going to share it. Um, so that is just a philosophy. 
Vulnerability disclosure programs are programs that you might see from kind of larger companies who have really established processes, or even just smaller companies, actually, this is kind of a best practice of, you know, how, um, how they take in information, how they roll that out in their products, how they might roll that out in their open source projects. Um, that's just a more established program. A bug bounty, which is uh, kind of Jennifer made a joke about bag bounty. A bug bounty is when we start dangling cash to incentivize people to find things. So a VDP, you know, sometimes there might be a reward for it, but we're not going to guarantee that there is this type of payout for this type of exploit found. A bug bounty is really turning on that fire hose of saying, we are ready to take in vulnerability reports. We're ready to patch things. Let's find as much stuff as we can. And we're going to incentivize that with money. So you think about your open source project. Um, you know, I think it's, uh, there's a lot of bug bounty platforms out there and they're easily accessible, which is great. But sometimes people jump ahead and go, oh, that's how we're going to address our security problems and how we're going to get vulnerability information. Uh, I would really advise against that. I, I would get comfortable with coordinated vulnerability disclosure as a practice. Uh, I would get comfortable with kind of as an open source project, sort of operating like you are a company with a VDP. You know, you're taking in reports, you're patching things, you're cutting releases, you're getting disclosures out there. And then if you feel like, you know, we really want to flip that fire hose on, we, we are ready to take as much stuff as we can, then you are ready to sign up for a bug bounty program. Yeah, and it's really situation dependent. You'll see bug bounty programs typically with larger vendors. Um, sometimes security researchers prefer to work through those programs. So a maintainer might get contacted by, uh, for example, like a hacker one. Uh, they might reach out to you saying, we have a report. Will you please log in? Um, any other thoughts on the different methods of uh, getting vulnerabilities before we move on? I think you're going to get good reports even without a bug bounty program. Like researchers coming from the researcher perspective, I can say, we love high value targets, we, right? What are the things that would have the most impact on the internet? And we love finding especially like high and critical level vulnerabilities that can make a big impact if they were exploited. And as I mentioned, like researchers are motivated by all different things, but for many of us, it is improving security and privacy. So if you can communicate well with researchers, you can get lots of great bugs reported to you for free. Um, and sometimes like a lot of researchers, they just go after what's interesting to them at the time and they'll report to you, they'll do the thing and then they'll move on. Um, but sometimes researchers will even be interested in joining you to support your project as a part, member of the security team. So there's a lot of opportunity to get a lot of great contributions from volunteers in the same way that open source maintainers are volunteers. So are many security researchers and they can there can be great partnerships there. Excellent. I wanted to, uh, we've talked about some of the good and some of the bad. What are some of the common challenges we've seen with vulnerability disclosure. And we'll start with Jennifer and then Anne and I'll jump in. Yeah, feel free to jump in because we can talk through a few different problems here and they are complex challenges. So I imagine we have different perspectives a little bit. Um, so the team that I manage, we've done hundreds of vulnerability disclosures and they can go wrong in all different flavors of ways. Um, so some of the things that are most common I've listed here. So um, you might as a maintainer ask yourself, what if like it's not actually a vuln? I don't think this is a security flaw. Um, in those cases, I would really encourage you to ask details from the researcher. Maybe their bug report didn't offer enough depth, or maybe it's just something you're not familiar with and you just need them to educate you a little bit more about that niche area in security that you might not have encountered before. Um, typically, if a researcher has found something, but especially if they have a POC or a proof of concept um, where they can show you that it's exploitable, um, it probably is a security flaw. And the real thing here is to open the lines of communication and ask questions until you understand how it's a flaw. Because um, a lot of things look like they're probably fine, but they're actually very dangerous. Um, another question that often comes up is like, 
what if we can't patch this bug or if we don't know how to patch it? And those are kind of two separate questions. Um, so when bugs can't be patched, that's most commonly if it's in hardware and you just can't write a software patch for it. Um, sometimes there's like backwards compatibility issues or the flaw is actually something that supports an intended feature of the software. So like patching it destroys that piece of what you're trying to do. In those cases, I mean, again, it's a lot about communicating with the researcher and understanding the flaw and seeing if there are compensating controls. Are there other things you can do that are not a perfect fix, but that maybe mitigate some of the damage? Um, and I think just making that risk-based decision while learning from the researcher about the danger of the flaw can help kind of inform what to do. But sometimes maintainers don't know how to write the patch. And I think that's very reasonable. I mean, we, we at OpenSF, we were looking at all of these um, computer science and software engineering curricula around the world, and almost none of them taught secure coding. So like even the best developers in the world from the most like reputable companies in the world or the biggest open source projects may not know how to write patches for all of the weird stuff that can come up. And that's very normal. Um, in my in those cases, my best advice is to ask the researcher, like just ask them, like, what would a patch like this look like? Or, you know, what line of code are you seeing this in? And how would you recommend or do you have any resources I could read about this type of software flaw? And often they'll educate you um, on our side from the researcher side when um, uh, vendors or maintainers go quiet on us, the thing I most frequently offer is like, hey, can we have like a quick phone call and we can answer any questions you have? And often it's just because the person we're working with, there's a piece of information they need that they're actively trying to find out because like computer people, we love looking up our own details and doing things for ourselves. But you can really just ask and get a lot of help. Um, the third one is hard because what if the researcher and I disagree on publication timelines for bone release? Um, I'm going to defer to Anne and Krobe here. Uh, who gets to ultimately decide the publication timeline? Is it the researcher or the maintainer or vendor? Yes. I think it's the researcher. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, Go ahead. I agree. It, it's the researcher, but depending on how complex the problem is, what the project, with who the constituents of the project are that are working on it. So a problem in a library that does spell check has a different scope and a different team of capabilities than like the kernel team. So some issues may be more complex and you have to bring in other subject matter experts on the team. So the uh, maintainer, the supplier, whoever is being getting their support or that is involved may request that they need more time because they have to include other parties. They, this is, or they understand that the scope of this issue is much more broad than the particular package or library. They need to get, they need to coordinate across an industry to get more people involved. But I agree with Anne that generally it's the researcher, but there is negotiation. Oh, absolutely. Oh, sorry, yeah. go ahead, Ian. No, I was it's, that's why I think these lines of communication and not being afraid to talk to your researchers are really important because they might come back and, you know, say, I want to disclose this in so many days because I've got this conference deadline. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, you start working on it. You realize, like Krobe was saying, this patch is going to be more complicated. Uh, share that with the researcher. You know, th this is all human human interaction after all. And being able to say, like, ah, we are trying our best. We really want to figure this out. We think it is this type of severity. It's going to have this sort of blast radius on our project. Do you think you could wait? Uh, we know you have this conference coming up. Maybe here's a compromise solution. Um, just put those things out there. You yeah. know, you never know what people are going to be willing to to sort out and make happen. Um, if you just kind of share nothing, you're, you're going to be left with whatever the first offer was. Yeah. Uh, those are great points around communication because on our side, it's like sometimes if a vendor goes or a project would go, uh, we will patch it in a year. The researcher will probably go, ha, 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 no. But if they say, okay, we need one week to do this investigation and in a week we're going to get back to you. In a week they come back and say, it has all of these upstream problems that we didn't anticipate. This is really hard to patch for these reasons. Here's why we think it's going to take us a year or six months or whatever this length of time is. 
then we're a lot more open-minded because researchers in general are wanting to see this thing patched. Um, if you say a year to us, that often means, ah, you don't want to deal with this until maybe you've been promoted into a different job and this is someone else's problem or whatever. Um, whereas if you say, you know, here's all the complexity we're dealing with, we will generally work with you because we do want what's good for the internet. Um, and this kind of relates to this fourth question. What if a researcher drops zero day on my project? So let's um, revisit that term. Dropping zero day is I found a flaw instead of us figuring out getting it patched and agreeing on a day that we're both going to publish about it because the patch is there and my report is there and it's all good. Um, that's if I were the researcher and I were just going to publish it on the internet way before you can patch it, maybe before I've told you or on a different date than we agreed. Um, and it's just free on the internet and attackers can come after it because we haven't got a patch yet. Um, so in general, I try to discourage researchers from dropping zero day. Most of the time, there's a way we can work together to find a better solution than that. But sometimes there are legitimate reasons to drop zero day, or there are things that a researcher in their own evaluation believes is a legitimate, legitimate reason. Often that is they worry that the risk is too great and the patches are taking too long or won't exist, and that users are better off knowing about the flaw, even if there isn't a patch, than leaving it completely silent. So that's generally the other side of this story is when a researcher releases a zero day, it's often they believe that users are better off knowing, even if they can't patch. Um, so how do you as a maintainer or a developer or you know, a vendor deal with this? Um, I think part of it is being aware that it's even happening. So um, having good data feeds and being connected to the right kind of mailing lists and, and things like that, um, being aware of what all these terms mean when you come across them. Um, and I think that in that moment, it's about risk mitigation and thinking about the timeline of how quickly things might happen. Um, if we start hearing about things being exploited in the wild, which is this last question we have, which means attackers, we know attackers are using it. Maybe a journalist came and told you this. Maybe you've learned about it from a friend in the security or open source community. Um, maybe people are seeing weird attacks in their honey pots and things they're observing on the internet. Um, in those cases, it's a lot more dangerous and we have to move quicker than ever. But even if you know the zero day is live and we're not seeing exploitation, we should assume that exploitation is coming probably within a couple of days. So in those moments, it's all about getting all hands on deck, figuring out what is the fastest way we can make this safer for the greatest amount of users, and then working toward that solution. And it might be an imperfect solution. Like you might be able to partially patch to mitigate some of the damage um, quickly, but then roll out something more robust later. Maybe that's the right solution. Um, so there's a lot of, again, it's communication, prioritization, and figuring out how do we manage this risk. Yeah, and that's where it leads us to our last question. It, there, CVD has been a thing for a very long time. What insights have we learned that we can share and how can the audience learn more to you get prepared on the subject or to kind of understand what resources are available to them? Yeah, I think we absolutely uh, have to plug our own work here. So in the Open Source Security Foundation Vulnerability Disclosure Working Group, we created a guide that really sums up everything we've talked about today. Uh, it has that CVD model. Um, you know, it's got a lot more very specific details if you find yourself in a certain situation of what do I do? How do I do this? Um, and I think we can probably figure out how to drop a link in the attendee chat or on Twitter. We'll, we'll get you that. Um, but, you know, I think we've kind of repeated a lot of the, the things I've seen and communication and being unafraid to talk to researchers, uh, to, to remember that this is a human human interaction is number one. I've definitely seen maintainers, you know, be afraid of, oh, these security people, they're scary. They, um, you know, <laughs> have their their black hoodies and all that kind of the stereotype of a researcher. Um, you know, it's at the end of the day, it's just another person in the field. Um, they're just trying to help you out. So err on the side of more communication than not. Um, that's That's kind of a really, really huge one I've seen. Researchers don't bite for the most part. They don't bite hard. Yeah. And you know, we put some common sense uh, things that we've learned over the years, like having that security MD file is very important. So the researcher, when they want to report something, they know kind of what the rules of the road are for your project and how you might respond of uh, being contactable. And you know, just, as we've said several times, remembering that 
when the researcher is coming to you, they're trying to make things better. So this feedback is, is a gift. It might not be a, the happiest gift you ever got, but um, I, you know, they're trying to make your software better. Um, as both of the other panelists here have noted, communicating every step of the way, setting, you know, being when a researcher approaches you saying, I'll get back to you in a week. We think this can be fixed within two weeks or our next release, which is in this time frame. And kind of setting that expectations will ideally make people less upset. And it gives you that chance to have that conversation if there is a conflict in uh, dates and stuff. And there's a, a ton of tools available to help yourself understand um, if you wanted to do static or dynamic code analysis on your own software to try to proactively find vulnerabilities before they happen, or tools like Dependabot, where it'll understand, it'll go out and query all the dependencies of your project and tell you, hey, X, Y, and Z dependency have an update you need to uh, pull from upstream to get those delightful updates. Um, we also, um, we'll take questions now, but we wanted to share a couple slides. A lot of different ways you can get engaged with the group um, with, you know, through the OpenSSF. Uh, we have Slack channel, we have a YouTube channel, we have um, a bunch of technical working groups. It's, they're focused on different problems around securing open source, um, supply chain, uh, secure coding best practices, critical infrastructure. So a lot of different ways you can get involved or learn what's going on. And uh, we have a bunch of really useful links here. And I think we uh, are ready. Any last thoughts before we open up for questions, ladies? Andy, you want to go first? Oh, golly. I'm, I'm eager for questions. So Jennifer, <laughs> give us a, your, your parting thoughts and we'll see what, what folks have. I think being very clear on how people can reach you, because that's one of the biggest challenges we face and also um, an attacker could be like, we're the fake version of this project. Like, come and tell us about your vulns. So being really clear on all your documentation, this is how to contact us with the flaws. Um, I think that's important. Another one is make friends with security researchers. Um, make friends with us. We will meet you in the, um, oh, Alex, what's it called? The uh, social lounge, wonder bounce oh, lounge. Yeah, yeah. The wonder spatial lounge. <laughs> yes, spatial lounge. Make friends with security researchers um, because if you ever have these problems in the future and you don't really know where to turn, um, it can be to us. And I think finally, um, if you find any of what we've said controversial or confusing or inadequate today, that's great. You should join us at our next OpenSSF Vulnerability Disclosure Working Group meeting and say, what you are doing is not working for me. Here's what I need or here's what I don't understand to help us improve um, the outreach we're trying to do and also the guidance and the coordination and everything we're trying to do around vulnerability disclosure. Yeah, thank you for, for the great discussion. Um, some interesting and important things have been said. And there's one question, and that is um, someone asked, what is the business motivation for security firms to pay researchers to report flaws in open source software? And the person okay. continues, uh, I understand the individual's motivation, but I'm curious why a business pays them for that's a great question. Um, so the company I work for, I guess I'm not speaking for them. I'm speaking for me. But um, I, I work at NCC Group, which is one of the largest security consulting firms. And I run the research division. And we take um, you know hundreds of thousands, let's be honest, millions of dollars worth of our consultants' time per year to do security research and find flaws and report them to vendors. Um, and our motivation for doing this is firstly, to improve the security of the internet, which is valuable to our staff, and that's why they want to do it. And that's why they value working at a place that gives them paid time to do that. Um, but second of all, it's good for us as a firm because it means that it keeps our staff skills sharp. We're really good at finding vulns. And when we talk about that uh, and the successes we've had in getting things patched at conferences or on our blog, check out our research blog, research.nccgroup.com. Um, it helps uh, our potential clients who pay us to look for vulnerabilities in their own software. Um, it, it promotes you know, the skills that we have and the abilities that we have. So it's a very positive thing where it's good for the researchers, it's good for the internet, it's good for the projects, and it's good for the companies that sponsor it. Mm 